there's some very odd things going on with my public reception lately, both here in this video blog and also on Academia EDU. And I can't quite figure it out. I think it's that I'm coming to people's attention, but I'm offending them. Or I'm coming to their attention as a curiosity, and then they see that it's actually real, and they get scared, and they run, laughing nervously. Or, I, you know, I don't really know. I don't get any feedback, really, or very little, so it's hard for me to tell what's going on out there. But I can tell you what's actually occurring. Um, here, I've done a couple rather edgy video blogs, including one that's a parody of Edgar Allan Poe's The Philosophy of Composition. That was two or three entries ago. And uh, it's, it got like 111 hits, and then suddenly it reduced down to 40 Two, and then it went down to 24, and then it inched its way up to 29, and then it knocked back down to 16, where it stayed for several days. So I guess they think that I sit there and refresh the page, you know, to artificially bump up my numbers, like for an hour and a half, I sit there and refresh, 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 you know. I mean, algorithms don't think, so, you know, it's obviously absurd that I would do that. Um, and then my last one, I had the whim to do one for the 4th of July. And I read Matthew Franklin Whittier's essay about the fourth. Now, he was, he was a deeply caring man and deeply patriotic in his way, in a very liberal kind of way, which is to say the liberals want to save the country, not cheer it whenever it does the wrong thing, see? <laughs> you know, so um, in that sense, he's deeply patriotic, but he's very concerned about the fact that the country's going down the tubes morally. So uh, two people have looked at that. I've waited several days now. This is like the eighth, and that was the fourth. There's only two people that have watched that video. Now, I don't know why that is. Is it because I offended everybody else in the last two or three entries? So as regards the philosophy of composition, my point is, by creating a caricature of that essay, that Poe could not possibly have written the raven. He could not possibly have written it the way he describes it in the philosophy of composition. It has to be a huge lie from one end to the other, and a lie where, as Matthew would put it, he was laughing up his sleeve the whole time. You know, he didn't write that poem. It's a, it's a big, barefaced lie from one end to the other, a sociopathic lie. So if you can't get that, if you can't wrap your mind around the fact that Edgar Allan Poe never never wrote the raven at all that he just was had such brass balls that he just simply claimed it knowing that apparently that matthew couldn't come out and defend himself then you won't get it you know because you'll think that i am disparaging the poem i'm not disparaging the poem i wrote it <laughs> you know in real grief in in the 19th century you know i'm not disparaging the poem at all i'm not disparaging grief at all i'm disparaging the idea that this sociopath could ever have written it see so what I was pointing out by running these two things parallel, the caricature and the philosophy of composition, is that Poe's attitude toward grief and toward his real attitude toward grief and toward poetry was very much the same as this fifth grade character, Harry Bugle's attitude toward love and toward women and girls. See, he had just as little respect for the poetry and for the author and for grief itself and for love itself as this character Harry Bugle had for girls and their feelings. Okay, so, you know, I, it's too late because all the people that I offended who didn't understand what I was saying have already left, I suppose. Then with regard to Academia EDU, I'm getting like, I don't know, 40 or 45 visits lately. Some people are coming from community colleges, which I never wrote to very many community colleges. So these are people I've never written to. Most of them, 95% of them, are looking at my article about Margaret Fuller and that she did not write the star-signed articles in the New York Tribune. She falsely claimed them because a rumor developed and she acquiesced to the false rumor. And she did not write the articles and reviews in the Transcendentalist magazine, The Dial, even though she was the editor. The one signed F, that was F for Franklin, which Matthew had used before and used afterwards. He used both of those pseudonyms, a star or single asterisk and F. So what I get is 
a few people will read the whole article, which you really have to read the whole article because it's cumulative evidence. Same with all the other articles about the other plagiarists. And then you get a lot of people that read, according to the stats on Academia EDU, they read two pages. A lot of people read two pages. I suspect, and again, I have to just guess at this, that they hit a mention of reincarnation. And as soon as they hit reincarnation, they it's very convenient for them because now they can chuck the whole thing out because they know it's bogus. See, if they see any mention of reincarnation because they know reincarnation is just a myth. It so happens that more of the world believes in it than believe in materialism. But anyway, they conveniently chuck it out. And that way they don't have to consider the possibility that Margaret Fuller was a liar. Well, here's, I did get one response, only one response, and it's a, it's a respectful sounding one. So here is what he says. I read with interest your astonishing essay about Margaret Fuller. My question is, where the asterisk signed articles after August 8, 1846 originated from the U.S., parentheses, i.e. excluding those sent by Fuller from Europe? Well, this is, it, English is not this person's first language. It's actually a typo in there that I didn't read. And I wasn't quite sure what he meant. But I took it literally when he says, where are they from? I think he meant, who are they from? But I took it literally and explained at great length, going back into my database, exactly where Matthew was when he wrote the star-signed articles, which subsequently appear in various newspapers in the United States. I didn't limit myself to the uh, Tribune, because there were, were none, apparently, that appeared after Margaret Fuller left the United States, except hers from Europe. So I went through my database, and I listed the exact date and the newspaper and the location for every single instance that Matthew used the star signature after he left the Tribune. And uh, there were several of them. It was mostly in the 1850s, the following decade, that he began writing under this signature, primarily in the Portland main transcript that sound exactly like the essays in the Tribune signed with the star. And then he used other pseudonyms. There's one MDW instead of MFW he used in later years, sounds exactly the same. He also wrote under Caleb Leathers, and those sound exactly the same. And these are deeply philosophical, insightful articles by someone who has quite a bit of scholarship. This is why they made Margaret Fuller famous. And the exact same style shows up under these other pseudonyms and under the star in later years. So uh, I didn't get that far ahead. I just mentioned that, you know, he wrote a lot in the 50s that sound exactly like Margaret, what's supposedly Margaret Fuller's. And I haven't heard back from him. So it's one of those things, to me, what it strikes me as, okay, you say this is so, show me the evidence, as though I know you can't show me the evidence. And then when you show the person the evidence, they're flipped out and they never write to you again. You know, that's kind of the way it strikes me. So that's the only communication I've had on Academia EDU. But now, after the first jump of about 35 people in one day that looked at the Margaret Fuller article, now there's maybe five per day or three per day. The last person looked at the Charles Dickens Christmas Carol article, which is the same sort of deal. And again, that person read two pages. So as soon as they see reincarnation, it's very convenient for them. I knew this guy was a phony, you know. So so what is this business of who is a phony and who isn't? This is very germane to our current era. This is the crisis we're going through. Nobody can figure out who to believe, who to trust. You know, how do you find out what the truth is when everybody's lying, seemingly? It's very deeply relevant for our era because this problem has only gotten worse. So what I've stumbled across is a very naive, extremely talented author who kept anonymous because he thought it was virtuous to keep anonymous, I think, partly, partly because he was doing undercover work to try to free the slaves in America, which was very dangerous, and he couldn't come forth publicly. So any number of sociopaths, of con artists, ripped him off. That's basically what this is all about. Um, and... I'm going to talk to you about another one. First, I want to mention the um, the fake Ethan Spike did come in as a digital. Uh, I don't have the physical copy. It's still lost in the mails, which the post office says it's it's not lost in the mails. We don't know where it is, but it's you know, it's lost in the mails. 
but I did get the digital copy in and I read it and I actually did an entry on online here. But since only two people watched my last one, I figured it would bore people to tears, you know. The gist of it is it's a fan piece. Matthew had not been publishing Ethan Spike for about three years. The public just decided and his fans just decided that he was finished. And this particular fan must have decided that he or she was going to write an Ethan Spike in tribute. That's basically what it amounts to. Um, and it's good, but he doesn't say a he. He doesn't understand the deeper philosophical purposes that Matthew was using this pseudonym for. But it's, it's technically very clever. There's two giveaway uh, discrepancies in it, two red, red flags. And the first one is that he has Ethan Spike being cruel to animals as a child, which Matthew never did and very likely would not have done. The second one is, is that in all of the misspellings, he uses T-O-W for the word to, like going to somewhere. Whereas Matthew and Ethan Spike would always use T-O-E for to. Uh, I looked in my database real quick. He did that in, in nine Ethan Spike series out of some 70. He used T-O-E for two, and he only used T-O-W once, and that was when he was literally referring to an anatomical toe. He spelled that T-O-W. So that's a dead giveaway. It's a little tiny clue, but it's one of those 75-cent accounting errors that shows you that that author was not Matthew Franklin Whittier. But other than that, it's very competent. He uses a lot of the authentic Ethan Spike spelling in it, uh, a lot of the superficial humor, certainly, he has Ethan Spike in uh, Cairo, Egypt, which Matthew always wrote from real life. So when Matthew, as Ethan Spike, wrote from Montreal, Matthew had actually been in Montreal and so on. Almost always, not always. So Matthew's very unlikely to have written from Cairo, Egypt, unless he'd actually been there. So that's another dead giveaway that that was an imitation. But it was a respectful, well-intended imitation, and it was quite clever. It was very well done. Uh, Matthew only stepped in uh, later on in August of 1866 because apparently this person had written something political that Matthew would not have trucked with, and he had to make a distinction to make it clear that he had not written that. Otherwise, I think he kept hands off. Now, concerning Matthew Franklin Whittier's travelogue series, under the pseudonym Quails, which ran from the fall of 1849 to mid-1852 in the Boston Weekly Museum. Matthew, as I've determined, used that travelogue to report his contacts as an underground agent for the abolitionist cause, probably reporting to William Lloyd Garrison. All he reported was his contacts. Everything else was entertaining. You know, it was philosophical, but it was entertaining. You'd never guess that he was doing undercover work as a liaison. Um, and he could not come out and claim his authorship of that. And at one point, he actually says why. He says that uh, he couldn't stand the rough treatment if the secret came out. That was as close as he could come to saying that he was under death threats and he couldn't identify himself as the author. Um, rumor developed that it was a character, uh, an entertainer named Ashen Dodge. And the rumor apparently developed because Matthew seemingly was traveling with Dodge for a period of time, became friends with him, which I know from one of Matthew's other series in that paper, which describes them becoming friends, probably ghost wrote for him, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the other contributors to the paper realized that the itinerary of quails lined up, at least for a while, with the itinerary of this singer entertainer Ash and Dodge and they put two and two together and got five and assumed that Ash and Dodge was the writer of Quails which was ridiculous because Ash and Dodge had never written anything before he couldn't even write his own songs he had to run contests he had plenty of money he was like a rock star but he couldn't write so he had to run contests to get his songs and he did the same thing later on when he took over this paper you know, he ran contests to get good stories because he couldn't write. Also, Quail stops as soon as he takes over the paper in May of 1852. Quail stops, see? So he was never Quails to begin with. But the rumor developed, and just like Margaret Fuller with that rumor of the star, he started assuming it. And the editor started colluding with him and, and printing little hints and then just flat-out statements that Ash and Dodge was writing Quails, which was never the case. Um, 
it, it so happened that when Matthew went overseas to Europe writing his quails, that Ashen Dodge was also in London at the same time trying to promote his sagging career because he had bombed in New York City. And he went over to Europe to see if he couldn't make a name for himself in London. He went to the fair at the Crystal Palace, the World's Fair. But Matthew was there to attend the World Peace Congress as an anti-war abolitionist. And he sings the praises of Elihu Burritt's speech, uh, who was also uh, a peace advocate, anti-war, and abolitionist, see? But Ashen Dodge was a racist. There's no possible way. First of all, that he would have attended. He was conservative and a racist. He would not have attended that Congress. And he would not have praised Elihu Burritt. So it's, it's impossible. He also, Quayle says he's at the reporter's desk. Ashen Dodge would not have been allowed at the reporter's desk. So it's impossible. And Matthew's image is there in a full page drawing of the opening speech at Exeter Hall. And it's Matthew, it's not Ashen Dodge. So he's caught red handed. Well, anyway, the, the historians believe the rumor that Ashen Dodge was the author of Quails. Um, so one of the books that they cite is this, and I just got it off of eBay. I just got it in. It's a booklet, a biographical booklet about Ash and Dodge from supposed to be Scott's Dime Library, number 10, Biographical, Historical, and Incidental Sketch of Ash and E. Dodge, 10 cents. And it's, it's just a booklet. You can see how thick it is. And this is the historical source from which the scholar was working or one of them. Well, I looked into this, and the historians can't figure out when it was published. I found a reference in Godey's Ladies Book, one of the publications of the day, from, uh, I think it's February 1862, when they briefly mentioned that Dodge has sent them a copy of this booklet. So this was published in 1862, like uh, 10 years or more after these events supposedly took place. And this thing is a big uh, publication stunt. It's a lie from one end to the other. This is all BS, just like Poe's philosophy of composition is BS. First of all, now I could be wrong, but I can't find any indication of Scott's dime library except this one, number 10. The whole thing doesn't seem to exist. It was published by somebody named a weird first name, Flodardo, F-L-O-D-O-A-R-D-O, -O -O, Scott. I don't know what Flodardo is. It sounds Spanish, but i uh, never heard of it before. But I think this guy was made up out of whole cloth. I don't think there was ever any Flodardo Scott. I don't think there was ever any dime library, nor was this number 10. This is just simply a, a phony publicity piece that Ash and Dodge has written himself. See, he wrote this. Now, this is how a wolf in sheep's clothing operates. First, he draws a robe of sanctity around himself. Now, Dodge is known for two things. He's known for being a teetotaler, for being a temperance man, uh, and, and singing family-friendly anti-alcoholism songs. He's known as a family-friendly entertainer. So he's got this kind of warm, fuzzy reputation. He's also known as a trickster whose nickname is the Dodge. So here in the first page, right behind the cover, and I have to be kind of gentle with this, are two religious poems. And the opening says, the following songs by James G. Clark have been pronounced by the leading religious press of Boston and New York to be the finest specimens of sacred lyric poetry ever written in America. And these are authentic. These are, in fact, written by James G. Clark, and they are, in fact, religious. So without tying himself to them, you know, or saying anything about his own beliefs, he's just, again, drawing this cloak of sanctity about himself. Now the next section is, in all caps, what good men think. So these are all endorsements. They're short, but these are all the people that Ash and Dodge has fooled over the years into thinking that he's an upright, righteous man, see? 
And so he's got all these endorsements. The first one is from Reverend W. Crane of Hartford O. I don't know what Hartford O is. And the leading members of his society published the follow, this following card addressed to church members generally. And I'll just read the first one. We take pleasure in stating that Mr. Dodge's concert in this place last evening was given in the Presbyterian Church before one of the largest audiences ever assembled in this town and to the italics full satisfaction and delight of everyone present. While many of Mr. Dodge's songs are humorous in their character, they are italicized moral in tone and appeal to the italics finer emotions of humanity. So then this goes on for two and a half pages of little endorsements from people about what a fine person he is. Okay, so now we've set the stage, and this is how con artists work. They create a sort of ambiance, you know, of who they are and where they are and what you're dealing with. And now with this as an assumption, you now are set up to believe that Dodge is a deeply religious, righteous man, see? Now comes the biography, a biographical sketch of the life of Ash and E. Dodge underneath in smaller caps, including his character, phrenologically considered by his old friends, uh, G.S. and L.N. Fowler, who are the phrenologists, editors and proprietors of Fowler's Phrenological Journal, New York City. So now he's going to invoke phrenology, which is the study of character by studying the bumps on the head, see? So this goes on for quite some time about how what a wonderful person he is based on phrenology. That's like uh, a page and a half worth. Then he goes on into the biography, which he himself wrote. This is, this is Dodge writing. And he gives some facts about his, his uh, birth and so on, about how he promised his mother never to drink. And then there's a uh, hand pointing symbol with italics says that promise has never been broken and so on. So that's his uh, claim to fame is that he doesn't drink. Let's get into the relevant part about uh, quails. In 1849, Mr. Dodge became the proprietor of the Boston Weekly Museum, a literary paper of large circulation and influence, and he soon acquired an extensive reputation as the author of letters by, quote, quails, the flying correspondent. Now, that's just simply a lie. It's simply not true. Um, First of all, he was not the proprietor in 1849. He didn't buy out this paper until May of 1852. I'll go into the history of this paper a little bit, as I understand it, kind of have put it together. In mid-1848, some people bought out, I don't have the names in front of me, some people bought out the Literary Museum and called it, renamed it the Boston Weekly Museum. Matthew apparently was very heavily involved in this paper from behind the scenes, and these must have been his liberal friends who purchased this paper. So Matthew shows up under a couple different pseudonyms on the first page of the first edition and continues to very heavily contribute to this. Some few weeks or months into the paper's life, um, there was a change in the proprietorship, and a fellow named Charles A.B. Putnam comes in as the part owner of it. Then Putnam becomes one of the editors. Then he takes over the paper. So there was a takeover. And this fellow was a closet racist and a conservative. So what it means is that the conservatives came in and edged out the liberals and the ownership of this paper. A lot of these things are very heavily political where Matthew has problems. Um, so now Matthew's continuing to write for this paper, but now he's writing for a conservative and a rather crass, worldly fellow. Very intelligent, good editor. Uh, Mark Twain extolled him as a man's man in later years when he fled to the West. But uh, nonetheless, and, and he's also, I mean, this is an ass because he writes about a humorous piece about how he tried to kiss rape a woman who came into his office and possibly more. And she slapped him and got ink all over him, and he thought it was quite funny. See, so this is the character of the person who's now running the paper. Um, 
So it was Charles A.B. Putnam and Ash and Dodge together, because Ash and Dodge isn't mentioned until Charles A.B. Putnam takes over. So apparently they knew each other, were friends. And these two racists took over this paper that originally was liberal. And Matthew, writing as quails, is one of the most popular uh, elements of the paper. He's what's selling this paper, primarily. And he is why Ash and Dodge is able to f sell 5,000 subscriptions, supposedly, to it. Um, he's funny. He's very bright. He's a good mimic, Ash and Dodge, I mean. And Matthew uh, didn't see his darker side. And s being gullible, swallowed this whole exter external persona that he had and lent his talents to Dodge by ghostwriting for him, see? and also continued to drive the popularity of this paper. But now Ash and Dodge is claiming it, and it develops as a rumor. So here in the biography that Ash and Dodge has written for himself as, as a publicity stunt, he says that he was the author of Quails, but he claims to have been the proprietor of this paper in 1849, which is a flat-out lie. He was not. Um, now he talks about how he, another publicity stunt, he bought the, the most expensive, he, he won the most expensive seat for Jenny Lind, the Swedish singer, in her first concert in Boston. Uh, Jenny Lind was being promoted by P.T. Barnum, and there was a publicity stunt that went on that the, you know, the one who paid the most for the first ticket would get lots of publicity. Well, Dodge did. He paid an outrageous sum. According to here, it was uh, six hundred twenty-five dollars, which in you know eighteen fifty money is just a huge amount. But he got a lot of publicity out of it, which is what he wanted. So then it goes on and on there for a paragraph or so about that, and then he starts up in eighteen fifty-one. He received an appointment through a Mesa Walker, then secretary of the state of Massachusetts of delegate to the World's Peace Congress held in Exeter Hall, London. After attending to the duties that pertain to his position in the Congress and becoming acquainted with many of the leading men of Europe, he made a tour in company with a small party of Americans through North Wales, Ireland, Scotland, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, Lombardy, I don't know if this is Sard. Sardonia, or I can't read this because there's a, there's a strip on the side, as you'll see, that's, uh, that didn't print. And Piedmont, writing letters every week for his museum, his museum, under his favorite nom de plume of quails, the flying correspondent. These letters were extensively famous for their vigor, incident, and humor, and were widely copied by many of the leading papers of this country. Well, I don't know if any of them were copied. I haven't seen any copies of any of them. It could be, um, but he didn't own the paper. It wasn't his paper. He didn't attend the World's Peace Congress at all. I mean, his name is not in any of the list of delegates. Um, he was in London, as I said, trying to restart his career. He did go to the World's Fair. Um, he, he talks about fulfilling the duties. Uh, well, Quayle says he was at the reporter's box. Ash and Dodge didn't have the credentials to be at the reporter's box. Matthew did. Uh, Quails praises to the skies Elihu Burritt's speech. Dodge was a racist. Elihu Burritt was an abolitionist. There's no possible way this is true. It's all lies, the whole thing. And yet, scholars have bought this hook, line, and sinker. See? And then when I try to tell them otherwise, they get a whiff of reincarnation and they dismiss me after two pages, you know, and... Not about this, but about the other discoveries I've made, you know. Well, I know what I'm talking about. I've done my research. And that's why the distinguished professor read all 25 pages of my Margaret Fuller, you know, article. Because he could tell that I knew what I was talking about. He may have, back, he may have uh, looked back and tried to substantiate some of my uh, sources and found that they all checked out, you know. So, <laughs> this is all BS. And then it goes on that most of it is sketches by other authors about Dodge. Here's a sketch that features Dodge and that shows him there talking to three ladies. Well, these are racist. Um, 
They are mostly written by a fellow named uh, the scientist Falconbridge, Jonathan Falconbridge Kelly, I believe his name was. He was a racist. Uh, if you look up his works, collected works, you'll find that he was a racist, that he was, uh, that he made fun of Ralph Waldo Emerson, for example. Um, the very first piece here under Dodge's sketches is called The Thin Abolitionist and the Caged Man, Madman by Falconbridge. And the gist of it is, it's a supposed uh, real uh, anecdote about riding on the trains, and some guy accuses him of being an abolitionist, handing out literature to the black people. And uh, he's accosted, I think, by the conductor. Well, Dodge gets back at him by accusing him of being a madman and getting him arrested as a madman, see? And then later on, years later, they both laugh about it. They decide that they're even, see? Well, it's pretty clear where he comes down on abolitionism. There's no possible way that this person could have praised Elihu Burritt's speech in the eloquent language that he did as quails. So it's this whole thing is manifestly BS by a fellow who's actually pro-slavery and a sociopath, but who wraps a cloak of great sanctity around himself with great skill. It's another P.T. Barnum. It's another Edgar Allan Poe. What Edgar Allan Poe did with the Raven was identity theft. It was, a, it was an identity theft scam, pure and simple. He never wrote that poem. He simply claimed it, and he was very clever, and he had brass balls, and he made it stick. You know, and anybody who dared question it was marginalized. But he never touched that poem. You know, he never had anything to do with it. Uh, so there we have it. I won't make this any longer than it needs to be, a little over half an hour. If the numbers continue to be as low as they were for the last one, and that's an excellent essay you know, that Matthew wrote about the 4th of July. It's absolutely relevant to America today, as much as it was in 1845. Absolutely on target. Only we've gone further and further down the road that he was warning us all against. Um, it's not just a little, you know, people hear editorial or essay and, you know, oh my God, I can't read that. That's going to be so boring, you know. So that might be the reason or I might have really offended people, you know. How dare I, you know, say these things about Edgar Allan Poe? And how dare I portray this horribly crass fifth grade boy, you know? Well, Edgar Allan Poe was being that horribly crass when he pretended to have written The Raven in the way that he did in The Philosophy of Composition. And I have every right to expose him. You know, and if, if that's what it takes to expose him, if I have to reach back into my own talents as the satirist Matthew Franklin Whittier, which is what I did, and write something that was every bit as good as a satire as anything that Matthew ever wrote, then I will. And if it offends people, it offends people. But sooner or later, they'll get it, that, that those two things are absolutely parallel, that that's what Edgar Allan Poe is really doing in the philosophy of composition is being as crass as my character, Harry Bugle. And that I have every right to expose him as such. So uh, there you have it. And uh, again, we'll see. Uh, I'll be watching the numbers on this. If it stays at two, I probably will not do any more of these. I'll just go back to my written blog and maybe do one of these every once in a blue moon you know, just to test the waters, but I won't keep making uh, videos, you know, uh, my apologies to those two people, but I just can't spend hours and hours on these things when only two people are watching them. Um, I do have them for posterity after I'm long gone and people have finally figured out that I was on the money, that I was actually authentic and they want to get to know me. They'll have these videos to at least vicariously get to know me a little bit. And hopefully they will be available at the little museum that I envision for Matthew Franklin Whittier and Abby Poyan Whittier's work. Uh, so you can get into a little room or a little booth or something and watch a video of me talking to you. And for those people, I am very sorry that I didn't get the chance to meet you personally. Uh, but at least here's an opportunity to get some idea of what it would have been like to sit down and talk to me.